urban forest manager for Arlington County. We manage about three quarters of a million trees through planning, planting, and maintenance. If you have any questions about our program, I'm happy to answer them. But what we're gonna do today is, one of the funnest part of Tree ID is identifying trees without leaves, except for the evergreens that we'll see along the way. Um, I'm joined here by Dana McCoskey. She's a many other uh, organism specialist. It's not just birds. Um, but you've got your little bird earrings on. <laughs> so if you see or hear any birds, we might be able to identify them as well. Good morning. That's perfect. That's it. it starts with an M. Mad cap dog. Mad cap dog? <laughs> You're very close. What did you? I just mad cap. Yeah, mad cap is the, is the first part. I'm also trying to change it a little bit, so... The lot, horse, I heard horse. Did you say horse? Okay, great. Yeah. Madcap horse, or I like Mad Dawn horse for Dawn Redwood. Um, the Caprifoliaceae, or CAP, stands for honeysuckles, which is mostly not trees. Um, so I find it to be less relevant for trees. It's very useful for shrub identification. But we have a lot of Dawn Redwoods, not in this park, but a lot of Dawn Redwoods in this region. They're non-native, but they're planted everywhere. Um, so, does anybody remember what the MAD stands for? Maple. Maple. What was that? Maple ash dogwood. Maple ash dogwood. Okay, so those trees are all opposite arranged, oppositely arranged. Uh, Don redwood or Caprifoliaceae. And horse stands for? Horse chestnut. Horse chestnut. Great. We'll see some examples of that here. And it can be an identifying feature. How would you describe the bark? You're seeing a diamond and kind of alternating. Okay. Sorry, what did you say? Flaking off. off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely up there. Yeah. I know so much. I wouldn't use that for this. Anybody know what this is already? It up could here? be. No. An, it could be an elm. An elm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's. An elm. Yeah. Do we, but I'm not sure which one. So we have quite right. Yeah. yeah, we have a couple of elms in this area that are okay. common. The native ones are American and slippery. Slippery elm is very uncommon. It's not rare, but it's uncommon. Um, and American elm is commonly planted in the landscape. And then we have Siberian elm, which is an invasive elm that has really dark bark, almost black. And Chinese elm, which will, you will not confuse for this, it, yeah. it has like a camo, like a camouflage looking bark with like peeling bark on it. Is Chinese elm also called Zelkova? No, no. that's no. a different species. Okay, oh, so and also cool. invasive. Okay. Yes, yeah. Zelkova, Chinese elm, and, and Siberian elm are all in the invasive plant. So it's definitely not going to be like a park or anything. Don't so assume that. Oh. <laughs> they invade parks. Well, and we planted them up until maybe like 10 years ago. So this looks like it's been here for about 12, 14 years maybe. So it could be something that's invasive. And we'll probably find some invasive trees that we've planted here. Uh, the, the, the roots, does this, is this an idea? Actually, they were not extirpated, but they were stressed significantly by Dutch elm disease in the 1900s. And a lot of them were killed um, by that disease during that time. In the meantime, people have found um, resistant cultivars. This is probably the Princeton cultivar, uh, which has a very vase-like shape. A lot of them do have that shape, um, which is resistant to Dutch elm disease. Princeton, unfortunately, has started to show poor resistance to some of the newer strains of Dutch elm disease. So what I look for is its alternate arrangement, it's, it's got this bark that gives a little bit. I like to push it a little bit. It's, this one is not great. I'll show you one that does it a little bit more, but it gives, it has a little bit of a corky oh, give. Oh, look at this failure. There's already a, yeah, an included yeah. branch, branch failure over this one here. You can see one yeah. American um, One thing elm. that's actually interesting over here is this black stuff is sooty mold. Sorry. Um, that is often uh, a mold that grows on the sap of uh, American elm and that can be sometimes an identifying feature because they often have wounds on them. So I probably, I'm wondering if I actually need to schedule this for removal because uh, this might, this either, this is not going to get any better. And it's in, doesn't it start eating into the tree? 
Seed pod. Seed pod. Yes. What is, is it opposite or alternate? Alternate. What uh, do you see about the branch uh, form, like how it's formed that's very distinctive in this tree? The little twigs, the twigs. River tributaries, that's a cool way of describing it. Zigzag, yeah, that's what I was looking for, but I like the river tributaries a lot. It really looks like a dendritic kind of river um, uh, watershed that, that, that it's flowing from. Um, so we've got two, art, we've got the, the zigzag arrangement, we've got the seed pods. The seed pods stay on until like January, February sometimes. So you can use that for a long time. Um, what, uh, what's really cool about this tree is that it also has, it grows these seed pods, which are coming from the flowers straight out of the trunk. So it's not like the sumac, which is at the end of a twig. Um, and that's a, that's a characteristic called cauliflory. Um, think about cauliflower. It's a flower that comes straight out of the, out of the, the ground, basically. And um, that's where you'll find the flowers in spring as well, these, these purple, pink flowers. When you pull one of those flowers off, it kind of looks like a little hummingbird. Do you also, do you also when you look at it, just kind of feel like it's an oak? Yeah. <laughs> that's, sometimes you can just use that as well. It's like, oh yeah, that looks like it's a white That was quick. Too close. Uh, so I'm going to go to the other one. Buster. Yeah. Yeah, you do have some leaves to work with here. Are they from this tree? We'll uh, have to guess. <laughs> well, this so do we have something else that might be more reliable here? Acorns? Any acorn playing around still? It's a very Yes, but it's not the first thing I look at. The white oak family tends to be more gray uh, or silvery gray, so lighter, whiter. The red oak tends to be a little bit darker. You can see the willow oaks have a little bit darker of the bark. But it's a harder thing to teach. Uh, all right, am I looking at a leaf of this tree? Yes. No, <laughs> why not? <laughs> That's a bad answer. <laughs> oh, okay, Dana thinks it's from this tree. Do we know anything that looks like this? No, we don't. Uh, you gave it away already. So yeah, you have to be careful. Yeah. All right. Are we looking at the leaf from this tree? No. Are we looking at the leaf from this tree? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. Could be from that white oak over there. So this is something where I would use the bark probably as well, but I might not be able to reach the actual species conclusion in the winter. I but can get to oaks. Yeah. Always though, there's some leaves that are stuck. Maybe not in January. Yeah. Like they might have been blown out. Mm -hmm. You might be able to find it, but it could also be a leaf from a different tree. Um, this one is a little bit more challenging. So we can look at some acorn caps and try to compare those. Look at our acorn identification. Some of our ID guides have acorns in them, um, and find some answers based on how what the roughness of the cap is. Um, we can look at the bark. We can look. Oh, she's got a very good ID. These acorns are on a peduncle. Looks kind of like a pipe. That's not oh, always that's common. It. Is that it? That might be it. Wow, well that that's a very Aww. good find. This you will not always find gigantic it. Gigantic specimen if that's what that is. What do you think this is? Well that's an English oak acorn. It isn't. It isn't? No, it's there's saying? another species that does this. Overcup? Oh. No. Overcup has a very obvious uh, cup that almost closes over the acorn. Huh. This is our county champion swamp white oak, Quercus oh. bicolor. Oh. 
and it has it often has that uh, stem as, attached to it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh. So here's here's something funky about this. This is where the um, uh, floodplain of Four Mile Run used to reach to. Um, and this is the edge of the floodplain, and this was growing here before the Army Corps, and we'll see this in a little bit, channelized Four Mile Run to prevent it from flooding all the way over, uh, which protected a lot of buildings and people from flooding, but it also prevented the water from coming over here. This tree has adapted really well to that change. That's a big change in hydrology. Um, that's because swamp white oaks are very adaptive species um, and handle a lot of urban environments very well. So it's probably 120, 130 years old. A lot of the trees, if not all of the trees, in most places in Arlington were taken out for yeah. the Civil War. Uh, so it might be, at this point, I need to change my statement. It's like 150 if you look at when the Civil War was. Some might be 170 or 80 if they're too small to even for the troops to care about for sight lines. Some trees were kept um, for shade for the troops. Uh, and then we have two old growth uh, forests. The forest behind the Lee Custis Mansion um, on Arlington Cemetery, and a forest in the um, Glen Carlin Park um, that is on the old growth network, which has no evidence that it was clear during the Civil War. It's probably too far away from the sight lines to be an issue and just in a stream bed. So, got handed a leaf. It's bark is bicolor, two colors. You can kind of see that. Two colors. In the summer, it's very dark green on the top and very light pale silver on the bottom. Oh, that's a little bigger. Yeah, a little bigger. Thank you. So, we've got the white oak. Definitely from the low without bristles. Then you got the bicolor from the, the two colors, which is not common in white, it's straight, just straight up white oak. Here's a, so if we look at it down to the top, Professor Chris. Vincent thinks it looks like somebody sat on the top um, and squished it. Yeah, you see some branches growing down, it's not always happening, but it's often, but that could also be a pin oak. Except that it doesn't have what do it looks like? Clustered. Terminal, clustering terminal bud. And this does not. Cross. It has a terminal bud and it's going to fool you a little bit. It kind of looks like a cluster of terminal buds. Yeah, but it's not consistent. And it's actually a bud that's before it. Um, it's not very. Come back here. Look at this a little bit too. And one of the identifying features of this tree is that it doesn't have much going for it, meaning it's a bit boring from at this time of year. The buds are kind of like, yeah, it looks like a bud. Um, the the branches they're a little bit distinctive in that they're kind of zigzaggy, but not a lot. Not like a red bud. Um, the the downward uh, facing branches are fairly distinctive. Uh, but the sit on top identifying feature of the form. The one tree that has to sit on top is the black gum. Yep, yeah, and you identified this tree. Is that yeah. The sit on top yeah. aspect is Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very critical. Even when you see the 600 year old uh, black tupelo or black gum, it still looks like mm -hmm. a giant sat on it. Yeah, I heard somebody say uh, sat on it or stepped on it. Yeah, uh, uh, that would be a really on. big giant. What tree is this? It's a black gum or black tuple. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't they also called yeah. witness trees because the wood was not that useful, so they tended to be left? Um, it's very good for woodworking and things like that, but it's harder to make um, uh, structural lumber out of it. Um, and it also grows extremely slowly. <laughs> it's like over 500 years. The oldest broadleaf deciduous tree on the eastern seaboard is a black tuple. It's about 600, 700 years old, black and it's only below, this big. Four, it's growing black, in the middle of the woods. Black gum. And um, it's in New York somewhere. I have an article somewhere oh. that I pulled out. Uh, Are both of these uh, Tupelo? They're both Tupelo. So you can see the right one also has that kind of downward facing look. 
And these are not species per se. So what other thing can we see that is not the leaves on this? Oh, the sea can see the fruit. Yeah. yeah. Sea balls. What's the arrangement? Single. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The sea balls. They're singular sea balls. What's the uh, bud arrangement on this tree? Alternate or opposite? Alternate. Alternate. Here, uh, I see a double. <laughs> I see a double right yep, there. Yep, you do. And, um, and, and also, when you see sycamores, you tend to see cream and tan, whereas you've got a little bit more of an olive shade with, um, with uh, London plane trees. Yeah. But it's still very subjective. You have to see the seed ball. So the seed balls is what gives it away the difference between London plane tree and American sycamore. They're both platanus or sycamore. The London plane tree is a hybrid between the American and unfortunately still called the Oriental plant tree. Um, and the American sycamores will only have seed balls with singular seed balls. And uh, any other one will have multiple. So I pointed out some multiple on a single stem. There's some up there. And it's probably a London plane tree. Oh, wow. Very obvious. What do you see about the form of this tree? What, how, how do you describe oh, this? Oh, strong, tall, very straight. Very straight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Although these particular individuals have bent a little bit at the base. Yeah. Any theories on that? Yeah, they fight for sun. Wind. Wind. Not sun. Wind. I mentioned oh, that we, we can look at that as well. Um, the, uh, the, this, there's a wind tunnel coming through here. You see a lot of open space. That's what's keeping these Virginia pines a little bit lower too. Um, and that's atypical for this species. Uh, but the rest of the tree is still straight as a, as a, uh, as a guess. Couldn't this happen with other trees too, where you get the bend at the lower part? Yeah. Because of the wind? Right. Yeah, yeah, if you go to some of the, uh, uh, the Dutch Caribbean, like Aruba or Bonaire, there's a constant wind across some of those islands, and some of the, the trees will look like they're swept that way. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, what's, what's hanging in the, in the top is the remaining seed head. There's still some seeds on there. Uh, you've got these little seeds that come off of this, and they actually kind of float like, like a little helicopter, not, dissim not sim dissimilar from a, a maple. But why is this not a maple? Because it's alternate. alternate. Right. You really don't need much else besides those, right. those seed heads. <coughs> um, I'm not holding a leaf here. Okay. And the straight one. Yeah, you do have the some leaves over straight. here. If you, they do actually last a little bit longer than maples do. It's actually an identified feature. It's kind of more leathery, kind of like an oak leaf. It lasts shorter than an oak leaf. It's got kind of a cat face to it. So we're not looking at leaves today. Yeah. So very straight form. Got these candelabra like uh, like little uh, candle holders at the top, and they'll keep these until like January, February. So you don't really have to. You can use this for almost the entire winter. Um, this is in the magnolia family, and it's commonly confused for a poplar. Please do yeah. not call it a poplar around me. <laughs> I will scold you. It is not a poplar and that's confusing. It is a tulip tree, but people will call it tulip poplar. Um, and I blame the Europeans for that. They saw a really straight up tree, which is very similar to the Lombardy poplar or Italian oh, poplars. Right. Okay. Oh, and uh, wow. that's the theory why people call them poplars. But they're not even closely related to poplars. They're in the magnolia family, which is the earliest flowering tree evol evolutionarily. Uh, you know, they are in the Magnolia family, but sometimes I think people who don't know uh, horticulture and just rely on common names um, uh, think of a tulip tree as like the tulip uh, magnolia. Right, so a lot of Californians get confused about that because they call a tulip magnolia tulip tree out, out west. Yeah. So, uh, but I still prefer to call this a tulip tree over a tulip poplar. Mm -hmm. right. Another bad name for it is yellow poplar, which is related to the color of the wood. You have to cut the tree down to figure out what color it is. <laughs> uh, but it's got these beautiful tulip-like flowers yeah. in, in, the, in the summer. Uh, have a lot of nectar in them. That, that's a big attractant. Um, and I say that magnolias are one of the earliest evolutionarily flowering species. They had to advertise a lot. 
they were the first ones to do this whole flowering thing, trying to attract um, insects to pollinate them. So they have the big flowers. Here we are. Yes, this is not just beetle pollinated though. A lot of magnolias are only beetle pollinated. This is a later magnolia that's also pollinated by other species. Um, but big flowers, lots of nectar. Some of the southern magnolias have tons of flowers. Some of them aren't even fertile. They're just there to just get the beetles to the plant um, to get them identified. So tulip tree, Myriad, Denver, tulip tree. Oh, it's question.